So, we're going to start us off. I want to thank you, Tegan, for the communion that you gave us. Thank you very much for moving all our hearts. And then also, thank you, Douglas, for the contribution you also gave us. So today we're going over chapter 5 of our Timothy series. We're in the book of 1 Timothy and we've been going over it for a couple of weeks now. And so today we're on chapter 5. And to start us off, I want to tell you about someone dear to my heart. I want to tell you about my sister. My sister was and has always been the best sister I could have ever asked for. Come on, bro. Some of you got to meet her. She is crazy, but she is awesome. Yes. My sister got me my first job. My sister helped me get ready for prom. I can never forget that. She actually got in trouble for trying to buy me trainers for prom. I wanted to wear trainers. And the, the time where I knew my sister always had my back the most was when I was in college one day and I got this notification on my computer and it said the new Jordans are, are finally on sale. There was a great pair of Jordans and they were on sale for $150. So, I was young, my sister was young, two years older than me. She was the first person I called up. I said, Emily, you've got to give me 150 pounds. I need these shoes. Woo, I need them. And I knew Emily couldn't afford it. I was, I was taking a bit of a, a risk right there and asking her, but she was going to give me the money. I was surprised for the rest of the day. I was actually so surprised by how much she loved me, I knew it wouldn't be love if I actually made her give me $150 to buy his pair of shoes. And so in the end, I said, Emily, thank you so much. Don't give me $150. You need it a whole lot more than I do. And from that point, I knew Emily had my back no matter what. Though, even though we had a close relationship, there were still times I didn't want to see her face. <laughs> there were still times I just didn't understand her. There were there times where uh, she would talk and I would get pretty bored. Uh, <laughs> it's true, I tell her, so I'm not afraid if she sees this. I, I love you, Emily. <laughs> but what has made our sibling relationship so good are the times where I actually went out my way to help her. And she went out her way to help me. There were times where I, was, I didn't understand what she was saying, but I tried to understand what she was saying. She didn't understand what I was saying. I came, I came across from that man point of view, this, 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 and this. She didn't get it, but she still tried to understand. But I know that today, because of how much we tried, we have a relationship that I know she has my back no matter what happens. And she's going to try it on my back. She's going to try and see everything that's going on in my life, from my point of view. So today, with that, I want to talk to you about family. The title of this lesson is, Build Up the Family. Come on, Christopher. My first point is, encourage the members of your household. And we're going to start our reading. Also, if you don't have the lesson, we've sent it out, nudge the person next to you and they'll send it to you. So we're going to start off, start off by reading 1 Timothy chapter 5, from verse 1 and 2. It reads, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him, as you would a father. Younger, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. What I find incredible about this is that Paul teaches Timothy using something he can relate to, family. And this is incredible because Jesus himself saw the church as family. And we see this in Mark chapter 3 from verse 31. It says, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they said, someone, they sent someone to call him. A crowd was sitting around him. And he told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Jesus looks at them and says, who are my mother and my brothers, he says. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister. And mother. Among all the people around him, he saw family, even though his actual family, his blood family, was outside. Every member is different. If we look around us today, we're going to see different people. We're going to see different cultures. I myself am trying to inherit another culture <laughs> today. But we see different people. We see different understandings of things. We see different uh, people. The way people dress is different. The way the things people uh, want is different. 
And believe it or not, even our terminology and our pronunciation is different. Mm -hmm. Married an American wife, I've learned a couple of things. Oh, yeah. Americans call chip, say chips and fries. There isn't much of a difference for anything made of potato and fries. <laughs> yeah. Australians, after being in Australia, we see that Australians say potato chips, hot chips, and so it doesn't go any more than that. But the British, I like to call the ones that come in a packet crisps. Ooh, that's what we call them from now on in my house, crisps. <laughs> it does sound like a lot of S. And then my hot chips are chips. And then my chips are, yeah, my hot chips are simply chips. And my chips are different to my fries. So yeah. fries are what you get at McDonald's, they're thin. Chips are the nice big, thick ones. <laughs> so no matter the difference, we are family. And this is incredible. In the Christian Standard Bible, it uses the word exalt. To exalt one another. As, to exalt one another as father and brother and sister. Not only are we looking to each other as family, but we need to encourage each other to be family members. To take on that brotherly role. We need to encourage one another to be our father, our mother, our sisters and our brothers. I think a, a good example is this one night after sharing, Tyrone walks up to me. And it's great, he just walks straight up to me, straight after we do good news. I was kind of surprised by how quick he got there. And uh, he starts telling me about his day at work. He starts telling me about his boss, to, uh, talking to me about the project he's taking on and how he feels about it. I only realized this when I started writing this lesson, that Tyrone was actually inviting me to be his brother. He was inviting me to a time in his life which he himself shared and was now bringing me into it. And this is what we need to do to encourage one another to be each other's brothers and sisters. A leader works to make each member of the church a part of their family. And again, this was another, this was another time where I learned it when our, me and Meral were in the time with Sean and Tegan. We were talking about our dream, mine and Mirari's dream. In 2020, Mirari and I want to get appointed evangelist and women's ministry leader at That is our dream. And so, it was a bit of a surprise. Usually, you know, scary dreams like that, you don't want to talk about it. Uh, Sean and Tegan brought it up at D time, like, oh no. But uh, it was really encouraging. So me and Sean got to work. He pulled out his notepad and a pen, and he started making uh, notes. Uh, a list of what we need to do. It was titled Chris's Training. And so we worked long and hard at this, at this uh, list right here. And we came up with an incredible two things. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really funny. Even though we had two things, it still felt as though there was so much more that needed to be on this list. And so we continued thinking, we continued trying, Tegan and Marara are there. Uh, we're kind of zoning out, we're not listening to them right now, we'll just try it. But then, Tegan, Tegan points out a great point. Leaders actually have to have a good relationship with the family and the church. It's an important part of leadership. It's an important part to have a great relationship, to grow in love with one another. A leader actually has a genuine heart to get to know and to give to the members of the family. And I realized from that point there, as a leader, I've actually got to have a genuine heart to give myself. Mm -hmm. And this is something you don't find in the world, a genuine heart. Leaders want to be leaders simply to lead. Yeah. But here in the kingdom, a leader wants to be a leader so that he can love and build up his family. Come on, Come on bro. So this point comes with a sweet challenge. <laughs> Encourage each member in this church to be your family member. Encourage each member to be your brother. Encourage everyone to take on that family role. So this brings us to our second point. Looking after the weakest of, our, of us all. It reads from verse 5 in 1 Timothy. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left alone, has set her hope on God and continues, continues in supplementation, supplementation uh, and prayers day, night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead when, even while she is, even 
marshy lips. Command, the, command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not prove, uh, provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be involved if she is not if she is not less than sixty uh, if she is not less than sixty years old years of age, having been a wife of one husband and having a reputation uh, for good works, if she is if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good. So, looking after the household is pleasing to God. Paul begins to teach Timothy how to look after the widows in the church. However, there is an exception when it comes to looking after the widows in the church. This exception is when a widow has children or grandchildren. So, Paul tells Timothy right here that if a widow has a family, he is to call up that family to learn godliness in looking after that family member. For this is pleasing uh, to see. To, this is pleasing to God to see them looking after their family members. Uh, it pleases God as we look after our parents, as we go out there and honor them. But don't miss the point. Don't miss the don't miss the point to what it means. Let's not show love to our parents simply because it makes God happy. Let's not make love simply because we want to uh, show love, simply because we want to put a smile on God's face. For the scripture says, learn to show godliness to their own household and make some return to their parents. For this pleases, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. The aim is to help our parents. The byproduct, make God happy. And I, I really got hold of this when I was speaking to Emily, my incredible sister about her relationship with my father. There was one time during our retreat that Emily called up, called up Mara and myself and she was annoyed, angry. She told us about how she made a list. That's when the bitterness comes along when people start making lists. Uh, she made a list against my father, everything that he had done against her, everything that he wasn't doing for her, uh, not asking about her child, not asking about what's going on in her life. And so there were many things that went on for about a good 40 minutes of her telling me about what had gone on. So there was a lot on her heart. And in the end, uh, I responded to Emily with a, with a memory, a story. Growing up, my father had many girlfriends. Uh, and so some of them came, were actually good enough to come to the house and cook for us. And they cooked some good food. Some of them made some great fried rice, <laughs> some great dumplings. And it was incredible. But unfortunately, not all of them stayed. And so one night, my father must have reminisced on how happy we were when we were eating some good fried rice and tried to make some fried rice of, uh, of his own. Unfortunately, it was a fail. Uh, <laughs> the rice was mushy. Um, I don't remember there being any greens in there. I'm not sure if there was any egg in it at all. But um, it was quite a failure. <laughs> Uh, and me and my sister, we sat at the table trying to eat it. Unfortunately, my dad uh, got really upset, went to his room, and he was really stressed out. And he was stressed out simply because he, he felt as though he was a failure as a father. Having to raise two kids, couldn't cook a good meal, which uh, someone else had to come in and cook for us. Having to work full time and hardly being able to spend much time with his children. Me and Emily went into the room and we played with our father and we can feel the stress coming through. This was stress of having to pay back bills that he cooked up, uh, trying to gain custody of my sister and I. And now to fail, now to, to feel like a failure was a pretty deep thing. So I told Emily, imagine a day if a man like this who looked after us so much was left alone. If he was to be left alone, even if he was to push away the people around him, would you really want him to be left alone? Would you really want your father who gave so much to you to be left alone, upset, feeling like a failure in his own life? And this wasn't something that I could take because I knew how much he had given to me. And it didn't matter how much, whatever happened in between that and now, because of what he had given to me, I would never be able to repay him. 
And because of that love, I always want to be there for my father. And in the same way, that's how we got to look at our own parents. That's how we got to look, look to them and want to appreciate them, want to appreciate them. And because of us remembering that and then looking after them, it pleases God. Yeah. But then, Paul goes on to a true widow. And I was kind of weirded out by this. I was like, isn't a widow simply someone who's married, has a spouse, and then their spouse died? Paul corrects us. He says, uh, here he shares what a true widow is. She puts her hope in God, continues in supplication and prayer, no younger than 60, having been a wife of at least one husband, a good reputation of God's work. Showed hospitality, served her leaders, raised children, cared for the afflicted. Paul is making a stop to the potential problems of people just coming into the church and saying, I'm a widow, look after me. There was a standard set for the widows. There was a standard set to be a widow. And this was because if someone who doesn't actually have a heart to look after other people comes into the church to take the benefits of those who do have a heart to look after other people and is looked after, this person would be ungrateful and not, not happy about anything you give up. Mm-hmm. Paul sets a standard as to what makes a widow. And so then he goes on to supporting the younger widows. If there's a true widow, which is this, and then there's a younger widow. So let's find out what a younger widow is. Oh, In first Timothy chapter five, from verse eleven, it says, "But refuse to enroll young widow, younger widows, for when their passion draw them, draws them away from Christ, they desire to marry and incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be adulterers, going up, going about from house, from house to house, and not and sorry." And not only idlers, but also gossipers and busybodies, saying what they should uh, should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their household, and give adversary uh, sorry, and give adversary no uh, aspiration, obfuscation um, for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. So the Greek word for uh, young right here is nirot, meaning youthful, a young wife. This is someone who's recent, who would have recently gone married. She's younger than 60, so she has, uh, let's say, 20 to 50 years of marriage under, uh, sorry, 20 to 30 years under. And so Paul is now talking about how to look after the young widows. And in the first line, he puts it simple. Refuse to enroll them. It gets no simpler than that. Instead, a young woman is to be encouraged to marry again. Why did Paul say this? Because of the passion that they have. A passion to have a family. A passion and a desire to have a man in their life to raise children with. So here we see Paul teaches that younger, wi- that younger widows are to be encouraged to remarry, have a life, have, and fulfill their own desires. So keep the burden away from the church. In chapter 16 it says, If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened, so that it may care for those who are truly widows. So here we see that the church can be burdened. They can be, it can be burdened by looking after other people. So we need to understand that when the church is looking after those that can be helped by family, it puts burden on the church. Mm-hmm. It makes it harder for the church to look after those who can truly be looked after, who truly need to be looked after, mm-hmm. and others who need support. Paul is teaching Timothy that not everyone has to be looked after by directly by the church. Instead, let the members of the church look after others, mm-hmm. look after their family. And this is what it means to, to this is the call for all Christians, to look after the family in their life who needs Reading from verse 17, it says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For scripture, for the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it, tra- when it treads out the grain. And the, la- the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist 
and sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may, be, may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, uh, prejudging doing nothing from, uh, partic from particularity. Uh, do not harshly, uh, do not harshly in the laying of hands, uh, nor take, uh, nor take part in sins of others. Keep yourselves poor. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine in the, for, sake, for the sake of your stomach and for your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are uh, uh, conspicuous, going beyond, going before them to judgment. But the sins of others uh, appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not that are not cannot remain hidden. So we need to lift up our leaders. An elder here, after we spoke about what an elder is, an elder here is someone who has a title in the church. They they're looking after. They have a uh, set ministry in the church which they look after and they help the people so in the first bit Paul is talking about the elder that makes what that makes uh, that is well sorry in the first bit Paul is talking about the elder that works well is worth double honor as his as his last quote said the laborer deserves his wages oftentimes we can hold back the respect that is due to the leaders around us. And this could be because we want to be the ones to do it, or we don't notice it, or we expect these things to be done. However, Paul teaches that Timothy is to give double honor to those who do a good job. So, what could an elder be? An elder could be someone who has a family. He could also possibly have another job on the side. He has to look after the people in his family. And then he also teaches people and gets into people's lives. And then here it says, someone, this elder could even be teaching, uh, like here on the pulpit, and also going out there and teaching in other places also. I only have one of these things, and that's simply a job. And even I struggle with that. So to see someone, an older man, be able to give himself in so many ways, this person, and to do it well, this person is to receive a double honor. Not only that, the scripture doesn't say good, great, or grand, but a well job. A job well done is actually worthy of praise. A job well done is actually worthy of respect. Let's not wait for someone to do a great, massive job before we give them any respect. Now, we don't have any elders here in this church, but the oldest person in this church is... <laughs> I look at that, Ian's like, Ian works a job that sends him far and wide. Yeah. If you want to go around New Zealand, just go with Ian and his job, and he'll take you <laughs> to new places. Ian has a family of two teens and a wife, and he comes out here and he gets into people's lives, and he also goes out and shares. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not only that, on top of that, it was one Friday night when Margo showed us to boast about her wife. I love it when uh, uh, I hear Margo boast about Ian. She said, Ian never complains. Yeah. Never complains. So you know what I did? I set out to listen to every single word Ian said. I was going to catch him at least one complaint. And this was a Friday night before a great retreat that we went out as a, went as, as a church away from Auckland. So I had a good set of days to find this uh, exit. <laughs> yeah. And so over those two or three days, I counted billions and billions and millions of times where I caught Ian have a reason to complain, but he did not. Wow. And it was crazy. Yeah. I was like, wow. Someone who does a world job and on top of that doesn't complain deserves respect. Yeah. Deserves double yeah. respect. So again, let's not wait for people to, to do a great or grand job before we put a hand out to praise them. A worker is worth his wages. But what we do need to do is purify the family also. In talking about how Timothy must look at the must look at the church, Paul tells him to rebuke those who persist in their sin publicly. For this will put up, this will put them in fear. Not only that, others in fear. 
I'm sure someone here can possibly relate with me on a time where their mum beat them in front of their friends. <laughs> I remember when my mum did that to me the first time. Whatever it was I did, I, don't, I, can't, I can't remember, but I know uh, I would never allow my mum to beat me in front of my friends. Never give her a reason. It's embarrassing, it hurts, and uh, my friends don't forget it. They, I forget it, but they don't forget it, and I have to remember it. So, we can't go on just correcting a person for their sin. Paul uses a great analogy for Tim. To, so Tim had a stomach ache, we see, and so instead of just continuously drinking water and waiting, waiting for it to go, he tells him to drink some alcohol, which we know can kill uh, bacteria. And so you, sometimes you've got to give it a little kick for it to move away. Yeah. And so in the same way, you've got to get into people's lives, sometimes correct them on their, on their sin with a rebuke. Mm -hmm. And this is what purifies the church. Not only that, we purify the church simply because God sees everything. Yeah. Yeah. In this, in the chapter to finish off, and to finish off this chapter, Paul is saying some sins are obvious for all to see, but there are sins that come under the radar. They both appear during judgment, though. Mm -hmm. The sin that went under the radar could have been an unloving heart to rebuke someone whose sin was openly and obvious. In the same way, there are some good deeds that are out there for everyone to see. And some good deeds that come under the radar. Sometimes I myself can want all my good deeds to, to be seen. Whether I think they're good or they're, everyone else thinks they're good. Sometimes I want my good deeds to be shouted from the rooftops. I would love it one day if Tyrone, Douglas, Ian and Sean climbed on top of this uh, building with a speaker and said, Chris did something awesome and everyone heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> but that just encouraged the pride in my life. That encourages the pride to want to do things for good simply because I like the praise. Not because of love. I wanted that because I was selfish and I wanted people's attention. And for a good time, I had actually allowed that to come in between mine and my own relationship. I myself wanted the attention. But from this, I learned that it doesn't matter whether people see my good deeds or not. It doesn't matter whoever sees it. At the end of the day, it's God who sees my good works. It's God who sees the love that I give. And God sees it and it pleases Him. So, a little challenge I want to give you all is to purify your hearts. See your sin and look for help. Furthermore, don't be afraid to get into someone's life and help them with sin. Don't be afraid to get into someone's life and give them a rebuke. Because sometimes it will help them a whole lot more if you give them a rebuke than you wait for them to suddenly change. So with that in conclusion, I will remind you guys to encourage one another to be family. Encourage one another to be your brother and to take on that role. I also want to encourage us to look after the weakest member in our own families. To, to reach out to those in our own families as Christians. And then look to praise others who are worth their worth. And with that, it's about to be the glory. Come on.